Greetings, creepy readers. The first episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast begins in three, two, one. Well, hello there, Creepy Readers. It's me, your host, Coffin J, and welcome to the first episode of the Creepy Reader Podcast, the literary horror show made and named just for you. Yes, it's our first episode, and we are going to be covering Dean Koontz's Frankenstein series, the first book, Prodigal Son. And I welcome today by my very, very best friend, going by the wonderful name of Zombie Zach. Welcome to the show, Zombie Zach. Hello and hello, creepy readers. Just to give you guys a little bit of background, Zach and I have been friends for 16, so we met at the end of 2006, right? So no, second semester, 2000, wait. Wait, was it first semester? It was first semester, 2006, right? Gym class. About two weeks left in the semester, if I remember correctly. And this motherfucker shows up to school wearing a Superman shirt with a cape attached. Anyway, so we ended up in the same gym class, and I'm a big basketball aficionado. I love basketball. I'm a short dude, but I can shoot. And long story short, he ends up on my basketball team for this particular game, and I don't think that I've ever seen such a game played uh, by a man of your stature. You did a wonderful job, and it really formed uh, our friendship. It was the beginning. It was the beginning of a very epic friendship. Excellent! And if I remember correctly, we crushed an arch rival of yours on the court that day, and it really solidified a great friendship, uh, the kind of murder of a basketball reputation. Totally, and they still haven't recovered, and you never played another basketball game like that in your life, so. And I will never again. (laughs) Exactly. It served its purpose, and now we're moving on. Now, just so you guys know, Zach likes to read, but he certainly is not the creepy reader than I am. Uh, I, I, I don't know. What, what, do you have a goal uh, on your Goodreads? Do you have a Goodreads and do you have a goal? Uh, I have a Goodreads. I don't have a goal. I try to find time between the most horrifying reality there is, which is called children. Well, let's start off this. What books have you read this year? Uh, this year, I did read uh, Game of Thrones. You're a stock of Winterfell. And I've also gotten through A Court of Thorns and Roses at the request of my wife. Yes, and I will have to read that also at the request of your wife before Christmas. So if that's something that you guys would be interested in hearing us review, I guess let us know. And um, I'm working on a book called The Paradox Hotel currently on audiobook. Uh, I work on an assembly line, so a lot of the time I spend... Uh, there I could be using for more books. So in all honesty, I'm just not reading as much as I could be because I don't really consider audiobooks reading, but I know they are, but I know they aren't. I have the same conundrum. I feel guilty every time I read or read, listen to an audiobook. I feel like I'm cheating somehow, right? Like this shouldn't count towards my total thing. I'm really not, I don't know, the experience of listening to an audiobook and then reading a book are two very different things. I find that my mind is able to like... My mind soaks them up differently. You know what I mean? Um, like I find that I, I I just get things better when I physically read them. But who the hell is who has the time for that? So sometimes we're just relegated to our audio books. And you know what? That is um I don't know. That's a little bit of a sacrifice I'm willing to make. It's not just a time issue either. You're also running out of space for all the books you have. So yeah. <laughs> so you know, creepy readers. This man has quite the library. I, well, I'm only about 100 books away from being an official library, and my shelf above my closet is about to give way. So if that says, I think I've got somewhere in the neighborhood of like 889 books right now. Wow. And I believe, uh, your wife told me this, that if you have 1,000 books, you can be registered as an official library. So who wants the creepy reader library? Send me more books. And you're only about 18,000 books away from being uh, the Beast, from Beauty and the Beast. You have a library? Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, indeed. With books. Exactly. Yeah, well, oh, don't even get me started. That library <laughs> is like a dream, right? Everybody out there, you know that library is a dream. You see that library and you just fall apart. So the, the goal of this podcast really is to, A, review books, but to try and convince Zach to read some of these books, too. He's a busy man. As you mentioned, he's got two kids uh, and a lovely wife, and he works 
really crazy hours. So I understand that it can be a little bit difficult, but hopefully we can persuade him to read some of these books. Um, and then maybe he'll come back on later and talk about them. Without further ado, um, well, you know what, actually, with a little bit more further ado, I really wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, at the top of the episode just giving a shout out to a couple of the people on Instagram who have just been so supportive and wonderful. Um, so I want to take a time and give them a little shout out. Um, so first of all, I would like to say just a big hello and thank you to Andrew Adams, uh, whose Instagram is Symposium of the Reaper, for sending his awesome book of shorts, Symposium of the Reaper. Um signed for our upcoming 1k giveaway and right now we are just short of 900 followers on instagram so if you're not following please go follow it could earn you a new book um some stickers some bookmarks some good stuff so keep an eye out for that um and andrew he, he's a really talented writer he, he has kind of different styles but i when i read um his stuff i immediately thought oh this guy likes poe once upon a midnight dreary you know what i mean it just has kind of that classic horror kind of Poe old style. It's really cool. So if you guys haven't checked out his book, you really got to check it out. Symposium the Reaper. He's going to be coming out with Symposium the Reaper part two here shortly in the next few months. Um, so he's one to look out for. And then I also want to say a very special thank you to leahbunny.reads um, on Instagram, who also has the Little Ghost Library shop on Etsy. Uh, she hooked me up with some awesome mini books. I've always been a big fan of mini stuff. I love building Legos. I love little models. Um, I love making dioramas just randomly. I, who does that? But I do. Um, anyway, she custom made all of these mini books for me, um, pretty much almost all of the books that I put reels out so far. Um, and she's from Australia. So we have people listening to us in the down under. That's so awesome. So big shout out to Leah. Um, she's such a friend of the channel. Really appreciate her. Rocky. Um, also the horror novel nut 76, um, who has given us a lot of love on Instagram, but I just want to give him a shout out because a, his name is Jason like mine. Uh, and B he's got to have one of the sickest book collections on Instagram that I've seen. He's always posting these books that I've never even heard of with these awesome covers and just so he knows if his books ever go missing it was me last but not least i want to thank uh dot s dot crow underscore author or ds crow for sending a copy of her book i dracula for me to read um so creepy readers if you like dracula and you want to delve more into the mind of the count himself the strength of the vampire is that people will not believe in him i highly highly recommend that you go grab yourself a copy on amazon so just wanted to give all those lovely people a wonderful shout out here on our first episode now my friend let us delve into the realm of Dean Kuntz, Frankenstein, the prodigal son. Well, first of all, let's talk a little bit about um, Dean Kuntz. So Dean Kuntz uh, was born and raised in Pennsylvania. He is the author of many number one bestsellers. He lives with his wife, Gerda, and their dog, Anna, and our enduring spirit of their dog, Trixie, in Southern California. So if you have ever gone to, you guys have half price books over there in Missouri, right? That's correct. Okay. And you're a frequent visitor, I'm taking it. Uh, yes, my wife uh, buys more things than I do, but I absolutely love to take her. <laughs> she let me know that she was on a book ban. Is that true? Is, is, is the ban lifted? Uh, she just has to read. She has to earn a book oh. to get a book. <laughs> um, so, okay. So anyway, and so Dean Kuntz, if you're in one of those books, like Half Price or one of those stores, like Half Price Books. Books, there's records, there's movies, there's everything that I want. And you go to the horror paperback section. There is always two authors that pretty much dominate the shelves. The first one is everyone's favorite, Stephen King, and then Dean Kuntz. So he is certainly a big hitter in the horror uh, novel community um, and a king in his own right, for sure. So... Also, I wanted to mention uh, before we get too far that this particular story has kind of a, a really interesting backstory. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to kind of summarize it to you okay. um, just because I thought it was really interesting. And you know me, I'm a fucking sucker for trivia. Um, so this story was originally conceived as a 60 minute television series pilot um, with this title. It was going to be on USA Network. Um, it was going to be written by Dean Koontz, and it was going to be uh, produced by none other than the great Martin Scorsese. Um, so who would have thought, right? Who thinks Martin Scorsese and Frankenstein, you know, unless it's 
you know, unless it's Frankenstein and he's going to bust your fucking kneecaps, right? You talking to me? That's right. So that's very interesting. And of course, the whole thing fell apart because studios just got to do what they got to do. They got to go in and they got to ruin everything. Right. They got to have every say about every last bit of everything. So because of that, um, basically the whole thing got scrapped. Uh, You know, Scorsese got off board and and it just got so far away from the original idea that Dean Koontz was like, you know what? I love this idea. I've got to put it in novel. So he wrote the series. And I've, I've been, this has been on my shelf for like a year. I've been meeting to read this. And a little confession to all you guys out there. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I, I have a very busy life, okay? I have a normal day job. And I knowing that I was going to be doing this podcast, and I, I didn't finish the book until today. I mean, I literally read for like 10 hours today to finish this book. So sorry for the procrastination. But um, so kind of an interesting backstory, right? And we we have kind of a little, uh, you know, you've heard of the seven degrees of separation. We have a little bit of a separation between ourselves and Scorsese. So just a little backstory. So Zach and I, we're best friends. Yes, we, we're doing this podcast together. Yes. But one of the big things that we do together is we actually have a production company based out of Kansas City. It's called North Kansas City Film Company, aka NKC Films. And uh, so we did a commercial a few months ago. Um, will, will you tell them a little bit about it? So we decided to do a commercial uh, just to kind of test our skills and get a production under our belt uh, while Jason was down visiting. And we have a board game that I love to play called The Web of Spies. Uh, We wrote out a script. We got some actors. Uh, One of our actors was this gentleman named Rex Thomas. Here's the, the moral of the story is that Rex was an extra in Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, which also features two very prominent actors, Leo DiCaprio and Mr. Comeback himself, Brendan Fraser. Okay, you know, this is totally off topic, but let's take a second to just say, dude, are you so happy to have Brendan Fraser back? Oh, man, who isn't? Are you kidding me? That man is so deserving of the spotlight. No one appreciates it like him. Oh, dude, I know. I keep seeing these videos of these standing ovations, you know, that he got for that whale movie. And I, every time I'm like, you go, man. You go, Glenn Coco. You go, Glenn Coco. And then I just want to cry. Um, so anyway, that's kind of our, our little seven degrees of separation between ourselves and, Mar- uh, and Scorsese. We've worked with the same actor. We've directed the same actor as Scorsese. Thank you. Thank you. And none for Gretchen Wieners. Bye. Um, I'm going to start off. I'm going to read you the back just so you can kind of get an over... Arching, arcing, I'm really not sure what the right word is, um, of kind of what the book is about, and then we'll kind of delve into some of the particulars. Sound good to you, my friend? That sounds amazing. Every city has its secrets, but none as terrible as this. He is Deucalion, a tattooed man of mysterious origin, a slide of reality artist who has traveled the centuries with a secret worse than death. He arrives in New Orleans as a serial killer stalks the streets, a killer who carefully selects his victims for the humanity that is missing in himself. Deucalion's path will lead him to cool, tough police detective Carson O'Connor and her devoted partner, Michael Madison. They are tracking the Slayer, but will soon discover signs of something far more terrifying. An entire race of killers who are much more and less than human and, deadliest of all, their deranged near-immortal maker, Victor Helios, once known as Frankenstein. Whew. So, okay, so first impressions based off the back of the book. Oh, I love the idea of a uh, Frankenstein kind of continued Frankenstein uh, relived uh, your characters going through and Frankenstein has something to do with it, but maybe is not the main part of the plot. I love that idea. Who doesn't love Frankenstein as a side character? I want to convince you to read this book, Zach. So we're going to go through kind of some of the best and worst of the book, right? And feel free to chime in with any questions that you have, any comments, anything that you're curious about. If you want to dive a little bit more into something that I say, then please feel free to interrupt me. Um, But first, I I, I want to start off with my favorite and least favorite quotes um, from the book. So what do you want to do first, least favorite or favorite? Let's start with the least favorite. Let me preface this by saying... It's not really that it's a bad line. It was just where it came in in the story and when it came in the story. It kind of threw me for a loop. And I just thought, well, this is a little silly. Is this is this whole book going to be a little silly? Just to kind of set up a little bit of the scene. So the, the story starts with Deucalion. That's the monster's name. And if you do a little research on Deucalion... It has to do with, I think, Greek mythology, and it has to do with Prometheus, right? The the one who brought fire to the humans. And I believe Deucalion is like the son of Prometheus or something like that. When we start, our monster is actually 
not in the States. He's living in like a monastery in Tibet. Okay. And he is talking with a monk by the name of Nebo. And Nebo's not in the book too much, which is kind of a shame because I really like Nebo. I thought yeah, he's kind of like Mr. Miyagi. Actually, you've seen, have you seen Kung Fu Panda? Yes, I have. Okay, so Nebo is um, Master Sifu. I see. No, 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 I lied. He's the old turtle. I don't remember the turtle's name, but the one who's like, he's like, what does that mean? He's like, I don't know. He's that guy. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, uh, even better. He was my favorite. He, t- and he just, I, I imagine him as like a little turtle. So um, they are standing uh, outside the monastery looking into, I guess, the beautiful red sunset, if you will. And Deucalion says, I don't miss much of the world. The sea, the sound of shorebirds, a few friends, Cheez-Its. Cheeses. We have cheeses here. Deucalion smiled to pronounce the word more clearly than he did done previously. Cheez-Its are cheddar-flavored crackers. Here in the monastery, we seek enlightenment, meaning purpose. I'm afraid I'm a shallow student, Nebo. So... Not it's not bad, but I just it's like the second page, you know what I mean? So the second page you're getting the Frankenstein monster talking about Cheez Its. I always wonder when I see a specifically branded item in a book, I'm like, did they shop around, you know? Like did they go to Pringles and Cheez Its and we're like, Hey, whoever gives me like a little bit of money is who I'm gonna put in the sentence. <laughs> of course I'm sure that's not how it works, but I like to believe sometimes it is. And then you also get free snacks and who doesn't love for free snack? That's well. That's true. It was just like you know. I mean, oh, cheese its or goldfish. Like, what team are you on? Oh man, that's so tough. Because when you have kids, you have to be on team goldfish. They're just, mm. but man, those four cheese cheese its oh. dude, those hit. Dude, they're not gluten free, so I can't eat them. So you'll have to have an, an extra bag for me. Um, but so not bad, and I get it, and it still made me chuckle, especially because Nebo's like cheeses. Hmm. We have cheeses here in the monastery. I know, but I'm like cheeses. Frankenstein's or you know Ducalion, the Frankenstein monster is a, is a cheeses fan. Okay, I guess. So here is like one of my favorite passages, and I'm going to skip around a little bit. I'm just going to read to you what Ducalion is saying. So just to kind of set up the scene, so Carson O'Connor is like this badass detective. She's Deb from Dexter, basically, just not as foul-mouthed. Fair enough? Okay. They are meeting for the first time inside the empty apartment of someone who's just been, uh, well, had his heart ripped out, or his hearts, I should say. Um, And he's talking about Dr. Frankenstein, a.k.a. Dr. Helios. His techniques are more sophisticated now, but he created me with bodies salvaged from a prison graveyard, my one heart from a mad arsonist, the other from a child molester. My hands were taken from a strangler, my eyes from an axe murderer, my life force from a thunderstorm. And that strange storm gave me gifts that Victor couldn't grant. I'm your best hope. Wow. That's a very great passage, like... Hey, I mean, you just took me up two steps to reading this book right now with that passage alone. That's the thing about Deucalion, man. Deucalion's, I mean, he talks like he's somebody who has been around the block. You know what I mean? He's kind of like the vampires in uh, Anne Rice's novels, right? They're all very sophisticated. So he's a sophisticated monster. Um, And I just, the, the cool backstory that you get just about where his body parts came from. And it's a little disturbing. That is pretty cool. Does he does he know these things because he was told them or does he like share the memories of these parts or what's going on with that? So I think he just knows them. Yeah. So he just knows them. And so the interesting thing about this is that so Frankenstein, um, you know, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein actually exists within the world of the book. Mm -hmm. So it kind of reframes everything. Right. So it's just like it takes pieces that you're familiar with, but it's also introducing new lore that is like the supposed real lore, if you will. Right. So in that way, it's really interesting. You're getting more of of A, the monster, and then also Frankenstein himself, who's a real nasty piece of work, if I if I can just mention that. You know, does, does the, the coolness of Deucalion's little speech outweigh the awkwardness of the Cheez-It for you? Yeah, the Cheez-It, the Cheez-It line feels kind of like a throwaway, just kind of sets you a little bit in the current world but man that line is just like that's a well thought out you know the piece together monster with the memories of someone else is pretty sick i gotta say 
Yeah, I do think that that you you kind of hit the hammer. You know, uh, well, you hit the nail on the head is what I'm trying to say about why they included that. I think it was just to show that hey, we're in the modern area. This or the era, I should say, this is where we're living. Which actually is a good juxtaposition between having like a Frankenstein and the old monster as well. You know, and he's recreating these people now. So he's doing the same thing, but you're also in the modern world. It just builds that timeline really well. So you kind of understand exactly what the world building is. Now, how far into that, into the book is this? This is pretty early still, yes? Probably like a, a third of the way through the book is when those two characters meet. Everything that Ducalion, everything that comes out of his mouth is awesome. It was really hard for me to pick like one passage, but I just... As I read the whole entire book today, that was one of the passages that I was like, oh, dude, that's so, it's A, gross and disturbing. Like, could you imagine walking around knowing that your hands were the hands of a molester? You know what I mean? And just, it's gross. Like, you can kind of, you can see the memories of an axe murderer. That would be pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't think it flushed it out like that, but that's where my mind took it, which is probably what the author intended. Like for your mind to just chew on that concept. I love it. And the fact that that's happening a third of the way into the book, I am so down for the rest of this. Keep it coming. So I, I want to talk a little bit about characters. And I meant to do this before the quotes, but hey, it's our first time around. So fuck it. Um, so I want to do like a best and worst character. And then after that, we'll talk like best and worst scenes. And I'm going to try and keep it like like I don't want to give too much away for anybody who hasn't read the book and also for you if you want to read the book, right? I want to leave a little bit to the imagination here. Um, so for I'll start with my best character. And my best character while we're on the subject is definitely Deucalion, the monster. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about him. So, you know, he starts off in Tibet. He's kind of found this inner peace and then he gets a letter and the letter is basically like, hey, um, somebody's still alive and the somebody's Victor Frankenstein, right? So he's like, this is the whole catalyst for him to go to New Orleans, which is where this whole thing takes place. I don't know if I had mentioned that before. So it has this really cool, I mean, New Orleans is like the most Gothic city here in the States, basically. I mean, you've got above ground crypts, you've got the tomb of Marie Laveau, you've got uh, Madame Larise, uh, I think that's her name, you know, that crazy bitch who has that fucking house that they did the shit with Kathy Bates on uh, American Horror Story. Madame LaLaurie, I think is her name. Yeah. What a great setting for, for a Frankenstein story. I, I really couldn't think of like a cooler place. There's a lot of natural magic there too. It's the voodoo town. It is the voodoo town, and um, I, I, not to say that that really plays a huge part, but I kind of hope that it, that it will flavor the rest of the series because there's like, I think there's like five or six books in this series. I don't know. We'll cover them all on the podcast, though. Victor Frankenstein is still alive. So he then has to leave his monastery and go to New Orleans, um, and he's basically received this letter from a, a guy named Ben, and Ben used to run this uh, freak show that the monster was a part of, right? Um, and, and the monster, and before he leaves, so the monster apparently has like one nice side of his face and he has another side of his face that's completely destroyed. And that's something that happened as a result of an interaction with Dr. Frankenstein. It's not something that happens, uh, you know, in the course of the normal Frankenstein story that we know. It's kind of backstory for this story. Okay. But before he leaves, and I'm, I'm interested to see how this comes into play, Nebo, uh, the old monk, the cheese at monk, gives him a tattoo, like one of those old-fashioned hand-done tattoos across one side of his face, and it's like supposedly for protection. And it goes on the scarred side of his face. So A, he has like a really cool appearance in this, um, different from the Frankenstein monster, as you would consider. He doesn't have bolts in his neck. He has this crazy like shimmer of lightning that like flashes through his eyes periodically. Um, so he just sounds like a bad ass character. He's very well educated. Um, he's a renaissance man, right? So he's a renaissance man. Uh, not really man, he's a renaissance monster. Um, so that's my favorite character. I want to talk about my least favorite character, and it's a guy named Roy Prabot. I think that's how you say his name. And Roy Prabot is essentially a killer hunting for the perfect woman, one body piece at a time. Oh. Lips, ears, feet, hands. What do you think about that? Kind of sickening. I like him. I really like him as a horror character. It's pretty pretty messed up, man. Well, that's the thing is it starts out really cool. And I, I get super Ice Truck Killer vibes from this, right? This is where I keep telling you that this book gives me Dexter vibes. And I know that when I started this book, I was really heavily watching Dexter. I think anybody would be able to find these comparisons. It's just very Dexterific in terms of this killer. Um, it's just very Ice Truck Killer. 
the thing that makes it underwhelming for me, you know, while he's interesting, they kind of build him up to be this really evil guy. And then for lack of a better way to put it, like he's there and then one minute he's not. It's just, I don't think like they did the character justice. It was kind of like, oh, I wish he would have played more of a hand. I get why they did what they did and I'm not going to spoil it for you. But I just don't feel like they played that character out as much as they could have because he was really an interesting character and I was really enjoyed reading his patches, passages, but he was just gone after like the first half of the book. Hey. Yeah, that's, that's very disappointing because just from the description of the character, I was like, that's a very good character. I don't know how that could be your worst character, but if it wasn't fleshed out and then dropped, yeah, I totally get it. Oh, yeah, and he's a 38-year-old virgin. Ugh. God, that gives me the ick. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, it's pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> I know I've mentioned kind of tangentially some other characters, like we've got the cop Carson O'Connor. So she's like our our Deb Morgan of the group, right? So she's a badass cop. And then she's got this partner cop named Michael Madison. And he's a cool guy. He's somebody who's like, yo, I use humor to deal with this dark ass job that I do. And then I guess my other, and this kind of leads into like best and worst plot points. And one plot point that I could have just totally done without is that, of course, they can't just have two partners who uh, have a... Um, Professional relationship? Platonic. You know what I mean? That have a nice platonic friendship. Of course, they both secretly love one another. And I just, I'm so over that. I feel like, and eh, did you really have to toss that in there? I feel like, you didn't, I don't think you get enough um, platonic female-male friendships in books. What do you think? Um, yeah, that's not going on too much. And actually I think a better representation of what I see more often is one feels platonically and the other doesn't. And so the other keeps it secret. Is it secret? Is it safe? Um, but even then, I mean, a platonic or at least one side keeping it platonic, I think is a much more interesting and relevant, uh, dynamic that you see all around. And I just don't see that written about very often. You know, it's just kind of too easy to see, put the love in there, you know? Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the things that people really love about, like, Harry Potter and Hermione Granger's friendship is that it is so platonic. They obviously love each other, but it doesn't have to be romantic. Aww. So I feel like that is missing from there. It was just kind of like a tack on, and I'm kind of like, eh, I could do without it. However, my one of my favorite, 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 favorite um, plot points of this book it has to do, okay, so I, again, I can't give away too much, but there is a cop by the name of Jonathan Harker. Do you recognize that name at all, Jonathan Harker? Uh, Harper. It sounds very familiar. Harker, H-A-R-K-E-R. -E oh, okay. Jonathan Harker is Dr. Harker from Dracula. I am Dracula. Right, so... When they first toss that terse, toss that name in there, I'm like, okay, Jonathan Harker is it like the Jonathan Harker. Are they bringing in some Dracula lore into this, and maybe he's like lived forever too. Not the case, not the case. But I will say this: Jonathan Harker is not who he would appear to be. Well, I will say uh, as a as a choice as an author, I mean, I want. I'm sure it was intentional. If you know, this guy's as big as he is. That's probably intentional, and that's a good way to mislead an audience, you know what I mean, and take you somewhere with a character you're not expecting. Can't complain about that. I will say this. You know, you you get introduced to things in books, and you're never sure how they're going to play. You know what I mean? You're just like, is this really that relevant? Um, and this book doesn't have a lot of wasted moments. Everything kind of – like, everything has purpose. If something happens in the beginning, it's going to come to play in the end. And so there's really not a lot of wasted moments here. So in that way, uh, you know, very, very – and a very quick read. Very easy read. Very digestible. Probably more digestible than a Game of Thrones. Just okay, saying. Okay, well, you answered one of my questions, which was pacing. And if it feels pretty good, I love a book that just feels well paced out and it happens quickly. Breakneck. I don't like a lot of drag-on areas. Um, sometimes with fantasy, I do struggle because there's so much – world building going on and I can get lost in that often uh, which is was my experience with uh, Court of Thorns and Roses uh, but I don't think it was written for me to be honest with you so pacing wise though this sounds like a very good book I think that's 
definitely tilting me more toward reading it. You could read it pretty quick. It's one of those ones that just, it's got like three or four page chapters, sometimes shorter. So, and each chapter you're just like, oh, well, I could just go on to the next one. It's only a couple of pages. And then before you know, it's been 70 pages. It's like one of those. When you have kids and you, and you, you may only get five to 10 pages out of this, like something has to be moving the story along. Because if you read five pages of description or something, something that doesn't really move the plot along, you can, you're like, okay, how many times am I going to do that before I just pick up something else? Yeah. Not only that, but I will say, so I, a little confession for you creepy readers out there. What have I done again? What have I done some more? I haven't read a ton of Dean Koontz. Um, it just... I don't know. You know me. I tend to get stuck in a cycle where I read a lot of the same authors. And I, don't get me wrong. I've read some Dean, Dean Koontz, and I, I I couldn't tell you exactly which one's off the top of my head, but I've read a few Dean Koontz. But this is, I think, my favorite one that I've read, and I really want to read Odd Thomas because that one's supposed to be some of his best work. But I, I did read um, on Goodreads that some of the people say that like his earlier work was his best and that some of this newer stuff doesn't quite... I don't know. It just doesn't quite stack up. You know what I mean? Like maybe he lost his edge. And just so you know, this was originally published in 2005. Um, and this guy has, I think, been publishing th since the 70s. So it's certainly later um, in his work. That being said, there's a couple things that I wanted to kind of throw at you just as extra kind of, I guess, incentives to read the book. So I'm just going to tell you what this novel contains, and I'm just going to give you kind of, I'm just going to rapid speed throw them out there. Um, and if you want to react to them, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll just keep moving on. But these are just some things that really stuck out, interesting things that have to do with um, some of the characters and some of the plot points uh, that I think could kind of, you know, induce you into reading it. Is that the right word? You know what I mean. So, this book has Frankenstein's monster 200 years after the events of Mary Shelley's book, which exists in the universe. This book has Victor Helios, the original mad Dr. Frankenstein, virtually immortal, creating clandestine army of lab-produced monsters and secretly introducing those monsters into society so that one day soon... Dot, dot, dot. This book has Carson O'Connor, a female cop with spunk caught up in a series of murders that involves body parts being removed, eyes, lips, ears, hands, feet, and who is haunted by the mystery of her parents' murder. Was Daddy a dirty cop? And to top it all off, she's responsible for her 12-year-old autistic brother Arnie. This book has Randall Six, a Helios creation living inside a top-secret warehouse plagued by purposefully induced autism. Something to cure for Helios, something with which he can multiply his billions as well as grow and maintain his abundant influence and power. This book has a weird gnome-like gremlin thing who springs from the torso of a Helios creation and disappears down a manhole. This book has a floating head named Karloff whom despises his creator and harnesses telekinesis to control a disembodied hand, Adam's family style. Oh, yes. Let me ask you a question. Do you prefer stories that, like, for instance, let's look at, like, It or something like that, right? It's an epic story in itself, but it's still very small town. It's contained. Do you like something like that, or do you like a story that starts contained and then ends up going global? Like, would you like this book to stay in New Orleans uh, primarily, or would you like to see it go global? Um, you know, just based on some of the highlights you're giving me, I do feel like this has set the stage to go global kind of easily. But sometimes I would like a story to linger. You know what I mean? I almost like a, I almost like a series where there's things that go on globally, but parts of the series, it's like, hey, it's a little more calm. Like I need to stay away from that life, but I still get sucked in in this town that I'm in. You know, like I can't get away from it, type of thing. Gosh, I know. And you know what? When you were saying that, the only thing that could come to mind, and forgive me, forgive me, all of you, and some of you will enjoy this, but I just kept thinking of like Twilight. Right, because everything is like in Forks, but then they go Forks, Washington, but then they go to like Europe for things too. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So maybe it'll be like that. I don't know. I'm hoping Nebo. I'm hoping Nebo will come back. That's the guy I want to see more of, Mister Monastery Nebo. So based on, I mean, obviously, I can't give. I gave you the gist of a few things, but just give me like your overall thoughts. What are you most interested in? What are you kind of tentative on? Do you have any questions about anything that we didn't cover that you're like more curious about? Well, I didn't write it down if you did cover it, but what is the size of this book? Oh, good question. So as I mentioned, it's breakneck speed. Um, 
It's got a hundred chapters and it is 389 pages. It's like a three or four page chapter. So fairly long for me, but uh, how is the language? Am I going to be just churning page after page or is it going to be pretty dense language wise? No, it's not dense language wise. One thing I'll say about Koontz is that he doesn't waste a lot of words, but he does do really nice. Like he has some really good descriptors in there. Just you, you get a good sense of the place, but it's done quickly, artfully, and then you're just moving on to the action. It's almost all action. There's not a whole lot of flowery language. Gotcha. Okay. And a final, maybe a test of our friendship per se. If I were to read this book, do you think that I would like it? I think that you would like it. I think that I, <laughs> I think there might be aspects of this that you feel like maybe I built up that maybe aren't, maybe not as satisfying as you would hope that they would be. And that is one thing I will say. So I, my overall thoughts of this book is I really like the book. I'm going to continue to read the series. Um, I read the whole book in a day. I mean, I had to because I knew we were going to be recording this tonight. But still, you know, I could have put it off if I was like, I can't get through this bitch in a day. But it was really easy to get through this. So what was your question? My question is, if I read the book, do you think I would like it? Oh, yeah, I remember the point I was going to say is like there's certain like the book is breakneck speed and there are certain things that I'm almost like I almost wish they would have taken more time. There there are things that maybe don't hit as hard because they weren't expounded upon to the extent that maybe they could have been. There are also things that are given time that are then not swept under the rug, but it's like I was telling you with that serial killer ice truck killer guy, you know, he was very enticing and then he was just gone. I feel like they could have either combined that character with another character or after looking back now, I'm kind of like, he probably could have been not in the book at all and it would have been fine. He existed purely to be a red herring. Maybe it's Dean Kuntz's way of saying, none of us really have enough time. But I will say this, so far we've got an author with a long history of success, great callbacks, even maybe some illusions, and a highlight list to die for. I think I'm leaning towards reading it. I might actually, I might actually buy it tomorrow. Really? You listen to it this week at work? Possibly. Yeah. I, I might. Yeah. I could just check on it for an audiobook. But oh God, you're making me want to read it because I feel like it's one of those stories that it sounds like you want to hear it in your own voice because the the wrong voice will kill a book for you. That's one of the problems of audiobooks. So I feel like I've been successful in convincing you to read this one so far. And I know that, okay, so I know this episode was a little bit of a hot mess, right? We're trying to figure this thing out. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. It is totally new. I mean, it's the first time, but let's leave it off by, I'm going to give it a rating of what I think it will be out of five, right? And then I think you should tell everybody what your odds of reading this are out of five. Fair enough? Fair enough. So I'm going to give this a, are we going half stars or, or there was no half stars available? No half stars. Let's do decimal stars. Okay. Okay. I'm going to give this a, well, I'm not going to use stars. I'm going to give this a 3.75 out of five disembodied hands. That's what I'm giving it. That is, that is great. Um, I think I'm at, I'm actually a little higher than you. I think I'm at a 4.2 in terms of reading this. I'd like to... I'd like to read this one before I go to my grave, you know? Yes. But even if you went to your grave, we, we could just resurrect you with lightning. It's Zombie Zack after all. Yeah, exactly. We'll give a whole new meeting to Zombie Zack. All right, man. Well, then I definitely expect an update from you on whether or not you are going to, uh, you know, read this this week. We got to come back and you got you got to give an update on your rating. Um for next episode if you do end up reading it so uh, and he will not read every book that I recommend I can guarantee you that so I think the fact that he's going to go for the first book is a success on my end I'm going to call that a win for Jason that's a win for Coffin J oh yeah it is a win for Coffin I am Coffin J Uh, so a win for Coffin J but you haven't read the book yet so you know if I led you down the wrong path then it ends up not being as enjoyable as I said it is I mean you're going to have a bone to pick that's true. And actually, I'll probably take less bones to pick from you out of, straight out of that coffin, right? <laughs> That's right. Hey, you, you stay away from my bones <laughs> unless you really want to. Uh, well, that being said, join us next time, guys. Uh, we are going to be delving into I Know What You Did Last Summer by Lois Duncan. And the format's going to be a little bit different because there are so many 
different. I know what you did last summer is whether that be movies and now a TV show. I think we're going to do a little bit of a book versus movie kind of format. So, Zach, you don't have to read the book, but if you have time, I might recommend watching the movie. Okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us for the first episode of the Creepy Radar. <sighs> Fuck me. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the first episode of the Creepy Reader podcast. I am your host, Coffin J. And I am Zombie Zach. Keep reading, creepers. <laughs>